<sighs> right, followers of the Church of Scientology include Tom Cruise and his fiancée Katie Holmes. Uh, there's John Travolta, of course, Kirstie Alley, and Lisa Marie Presley. But there are persistent reports that for the humbler Scientologists, life in the sect, some call it a cult, the people who are there don't call it either, can be rather unpleasant, even frightening. Its founder, sci-fi pulp writer L. Ron Hubbard, reportedly said this at a writers' convention in 1948. Creating a new religion would be the best way to make money. Well, five years later, he founded the Church of Scientology, preaching that humans are infested with the spirits of Thetans, spelled T-H-E-T-A-N-S, Thetans, Thetans, an alien race who arrived on Earth at some point in the past, some say 75,000 years ago. Uh, Astra Woodcraft says that her years with Scientology turned into a nightmare, something that Reverend Janet Kenyon from the Church of Scientology simply will not accept. But let's say your story first. How long were you in the Scientologists for? Um, from when I was born until I left when I was 19. And you say that it was a, you found it a completely controlling organization. That Absolutely. You, everything that you did, said, thought, yes. fell, in, fell into their control. Yes, very much control. Can you give us some examples of that? Um, well, when I was working there, um, all our mail was opened and copied. Mm -hmm. All phone calls um, were, we, if we were to make a phone call to someone outside of the church, it was to be recorded or listened in on by their security personnel. Um, we basically worked there, lived there, ate there. We weren't allowed to leave the building without permission. What's this you what's married this? when you were um, only 15, didn't you? A month after my 15th birthday. Oh, is, is that, inc that was encouraged, obviously. Basically ordered. Yeah. yeah. We can't go into detail at this time of night, too much detail, but is it, you've said that, and this, you weren't alone in this, that when you were 15 years old, um, the Church of Scientology encouraged you to give very specific and explicit sexual advice to middle-aged men. Yes, at that time I held the job of what would have, it was called an ethics officer. And any kind of sexual conduct that was considered um, unacceptable, they would be sent to me to be handled, basically, to be set straight. Can you tell us what contact assisting was? A, a contact assist is, um, if you get hurt, um, they believe that um, by repeating the action that caused the injury over and over and over, say you hit your arm on the table, so you'd redo it, you'd hit your arm on the table lightly, not, mm -hmm. not to cause pain over and over and over, and by doing that, that's supposed to make the pain go Instead away. Instead of putting a plaster on it or... Yeah. Right, well, you'd do that later or beforehand. Let me come to Janet. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you, you've heard what Astra said, specifically at 15, she was encouraged to marry. Um, at the same age, she was encouraged to give um, sexual counselling to men who are older than herself. Does, does that happen in your, in your experience? Well, Astral is the first person I've met that married at the age of um, 15. Um, you know, the experience that Astral is describing is it's just not my personal experience at all. I've been a member of the C organization for over 30 years now. That's the same organization you were a member yes. of, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's a religious order within the, uh, within the church. And um, as I said, I've been a member for over 30 years. I've traveled around the world. Um, I've been in Los Angeles. I raised my uh, children. Um, in the Sioux organization, and, and Astral is the first one that I've met who was married at the age of 15. I have to say, though, um, mm. you've been with the church for how many years, yeah. did you say 30? Well, 33 years. 33, yeah. and, and I've been a journalist for roughly the same length of time, <laughs> okay? Um, and I've interviewed, oh, maybe a dozen people like her, mm. who've either been born into Scientology or have been uh, brought into it, and have come out with very similar stories, stories of control, stories of being very frightened, stories of not having much free will at all, and sometimes even of abuse. So you, she may be the first person you've met who, who, who mm. tells stories like that. I can promise you, journalistically, she's one of many that I've met, and there have been many more that I haven't met but have read interviews with. It does seem to have a problem, doesn't it, Scientology, with, with ex-members who leave s quoting stories very similar to this. Well, you know, the subject of a religious apostasy is, um, is littered throughout history. It's not something that is um, new. You have different people who have different experiences. You have, you know, you have human beings within a religion, within any organization, mm. and one can't account for every experience that every individual um, has. No, in, but if you take, in a religion, like if you take religion, such as, such as Christianity, right? yeah, which, yeah. Which, which goes back 2,000 years, and then mm -hmm. the Old Testament goes back much further than that, you have a very long tradition. I mean, the, the problem that many of us have, who aren't Scientologists with, with your religion, which you're free, obviously, to practice, is that it, was, it seems to have been invented by a pulp science fiction writer in the 1950s, and, and that gives us all pause for thought. I, I know, I, and, you know, Mr. Hubbard is actually... Um you know, very much underplayed. He's often, you know, said that he was a science fiction writer. Well, he was also a writer of, you know, 
of Western fantasy mm. um, and so forth. And, and during the um, 30s, he made his living. That's how he funded his research into, um, into the religion of Scientology was by his writing. At a very early age, he had the opportunity, because his father was in the Navy, of, of traveling out to the East. And it was at that point in time when he took that opportunity to study. That he found uh, mysticism. Okay. That's mm. right, exactly. Mm. All right. Uh, it, j just let's leave uh, Ron Hubbard yes. out of it for a minute. Come back to you. Um, Astra, you also say, one of, the, one of the allegations you make is that you became pregnant. Yes. And that had you stayed, you didn't. You got out then. Had you stayed, um, you would have had to abort the baby? Yes. Is that, that's absolutely, that that's was a absolutely. declared policy in the, your part of the organization? About two years before I left, they came out with a new policy that all C organization members were not allowed to have children anymore because they didn't have the means to take care of them. Well, what do you say to that? The actual policy of the church, um, the subject of abortion and how the church feels about abortion is covered in the original book, Dianetics. Um, the policy of the church within the Sea Organization at this point in time in 1986, I think is what Astra is, uh, is referring to, it, it did change. Um, but the policy was if an individual wanted to have a family, they were transferred to uh, a lower church that had less hours so that they could take that opportunity to, to raise their children. Um, I know a number of members here who just simply decided that they wanted to raise a family and they left the Sea Organization and, um, you know, happily married, have their children, okay. good but communication what, what, with so, their family. Sorry, excuse and, me, and supposing they chose not to leave the Sea Org uh, organization, what if they decided they wanted to stay there and have a family? You say, are you saying they would not have been allowed to? Well, that's right. Within the Sea organization, because, you know, part of what's expected of members of the Sea organization is to be able to travel, you know, at a moment's notice and so forth, and that's just, that's too hard on a family um, to be able to do that. So within that structure, I think that's of sort of putting. Uh, yeah, that's that's an odd way to put it. It would be too hard on a family. What they mean is it didn't. What you mean is it didn't suit the organisation, really. It didn't suit the family members either. Um, it's well, okay. much easier to raise a family if you have, you know, your nine to five, you know, type okay. of a job. Can I make two two, two yeah. more points for you to answer? Um, it's, it's known that in Scientology you gain more knowledge by going up the various That's levels right, yeah. and no one quite knows how many levels there are because at the top end is shrouded in, in, in secrecy, which a lot of religions are. That's yeah. okay. Um, but it's also true that one has to pay to, to go to those levels. Um, and one of the accusations against Scientology is that it's just basically a gigantic uh, fundraising pyramid. It's about actually raising money and suckering in kids, families um, in, in, in that aim. But what would you say to that? I think that wherever those rumors come, they've grown very long legs and are wandering around, um, you know, carrying a story that has absolutely nothing to do with the truth. And those kind of stories are absolutely. So you don't have different. to pay to go on to the next level. When you, you go do, up, you? when you go up to the different levels, um, depending on how you actually, you know, want to structure it, you can pay if you like. Um, you can contribute. Hmm. Um, I mean, I can tell you, I've gone up a number of those levels, and I haven't paid. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it depends on the individual and how they as want a, to do it. As a member of the SEER organization, you don't pay anything while you're in it. But if you leave like I did, they send you a bill. They sent me a bill for $89,000. you didn't pay it, presumably. Of course not. <laughs> well, so they, can't really, they couldn't really enforce that. One, no. more, one, no. more, one more question. There's been a lot of speculation in the press here about um, Tom Cruise's pregnant fiancée, Katie Holmes, mm. saying that she will have to, um, she, when she gives birth, she will have to do so noiselessly and without any pain killing drugs. Is that correct? That will be her choice um, completely. I, I know there's a lot of stories in the, um, in the newspapers that are running with the, uh, with the whole subject of silent um, birth. And the actual subject of a silent birth is something that's been around for decades. It's not new um, at all and is not only um, uh, relative to Scientologists. Uh, and if one wants to understand, you know, more about that whole concept, it really is covered in, uh, in, the, in the book Dianetics. Mm, okay. um, and as far as painkillers, that is completely up to her. Different women have different experiences when they deliver a baby, you know, even the same woman from one baby to another. I know that. Mm. Yeah. But whatever. Okay. You're glad you're around <laughs> right. it. Yes, very much okay. so. Thank, Thank you, you both. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now,